Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship today. We're glad to have you all with us. A special welcome to our guests who are with us today. We conclude our series on going from the river of Jesus' baptism now to the Mount of Transfiguration. And it's on this Mount that we come to this wonderful conclusion and put all these different pieces together to realize who Jesus really is, to see why Jesus really came, and to see what he was about to do. Because he goes from this mountain to another mountain, and in between, it's going to look a little scary. It's not going to look so glorious as it does today, but it is a wonderful opportunity for us to zero in on our Savior, Jesus. With that, we have a short video from, for you for our, our service, for our theme that we've been going through. Then we'll jump into our hymn, our first hymn on page four, and we pray that God would bless our worship. Your footprints through the desert land to join in flowing stream. There you heard the herald crying in Israel's old prophetic dream. He is coming, he is coming, he will cleanse the earth with flame. Sinners plunge beneath the waters, wash away your guilt and shame. Christ, you heard the stirring summons as by Jordan's bank you stood. Bay through sinless with your people in the river's cleansing flood. High above the heavens open came the Spirit as a God. Spoke a voice beyond all hearing, see my Son, the one I love. Son of God, the road from Jordan led at last to Calvary's hill. There upon the cross forsaken, you fulfilled the Father's will. Lamb of God, we see you die, sinless yet for sinners slain. But when death rose up to triumph, you began your glorious reign. God, in baptism you have made us one with Christ our risen Lord. Freed us, claimed us, cleansed us, given through the word, heard and the word. Help us hear your urgent summons, calling us to serve you now. 
Send us forth your sons and daughters from the cross upon your brow. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. with you. Let us pray. O God, in the glorious transfiguration of your only begotten Son, you confirm the mysteries of the faith by the testimony of Moses and Elijah. 
And in the voice that came from the bright cloud, you foreshadowed our adoption as your sons. In your mercy, make us co-heirs of glory with Jesus, our King, and bring us at last to heaven. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. Our first reading comes from 2 Kings. The prophet Elijah never tasted death, but instead was taken directly up to heaven. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Elijah appeared with the glorious Son of God who would taste death. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah was traveling with Elisha from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here. For the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, As surely as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord is taking your master away from you? Then he said, Yes, I know. Be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here because the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As surely as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. Then the sons of the prophets who were in Jericho approached Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord has taken your master away from you? He said, Yes, I know. Be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here because the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, as surely as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Then 50 men from the sons of the prophets came and stood and watched them from a distance while two of them were standing at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, folded it together, and struck the water. The water divided to the right and to the left. Then the two of them crossed on dry land. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask me for whatever I can do for you before I am taken from you. Then Elisha said, Let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. He said, You have asked for a difficult thing. If you see me being taken from you, it will surely be yours. But if not, then it will not. While they were walking and talking, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire came and separated them. So Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha was watching and crying out, My father, my father, Israel's chariots and its charioteers. The word of the Lord. God. Why do the nations rage? Why do the peoples crumble and faint? The kings of the earth take a stand, and the rulers join together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us tear off their chains and throw off their robes from us. The one who is seated in heaven laughs. The Lord stops at them. Then he speaks to them in his anger, and in his wrath he terrifies them. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, Our second reading comes from 2 Corinthians. We cannot yet physically see what those disciples saw on the Mount of Transfiguration, but St. Paul teaches we can still see the glory of Christ's light in the gospel. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled among those who are perishing. In the case of those people, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from clearly seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is God's image. Indeed, we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For the God who said, light will shine out of darkness, is the same one who made light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the person 
of Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand in honor of the gospel. cloud appeared and overshadowed them, and a voice came from the cloud, saying, This is my Son, whom I love. Listen to him. Our Holy Gospel comes from Mark chapter 9. This lesson will serve as a basis for our sermon. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were alone by themselves. There he was transfigured in front of them. His clothes became radiant, dazzling white, whiter than anyone on earth could bleach them. And Elijah appeared to them together with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say because they were terrified. A cloud appeared and overshadowed them, and a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. May be seated and we continue with the hymn of the day.
Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, grace, mercy, and peace be yours in abundance from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. There come a few moments in life that you don't want to forget. On the converse, there come a few moments in life that you wish you would always forget, that you, you never want to relive again. Today, as we look at Jesus, we see him in the, the former rather than the latter. We see him in a moment that we don't want to forget. Those moments we have in life that are cherished by us, that we want to hold on to forever, are, are precious, uh, amazing, astonishing times in our lives that we always look back to and can say, I, I remember that day. Maybe you remember the exact time, the exact day of the week it was, and it's, it's etched in your mind as unforgettable. Something that you'll tell your, your, your friends about, something maybe someday you'll tell your grandkids about is, I remember that day when this happened. Can you think of one of those times in your life? I'm not talking about tragedies. I'm not talking about uh, terrible things. I'm talking about instead wonderful things like marriage or the birth of a child or the, the installation of, of a pastor or, or something like that, something big, something uh, memorable to you, something that happened in your life. Think about that moment. Think about those unforgettable times that you've experienced. And then multiply it by, I don't know, a million, because it's amazing to see what happens on this Mount of Transfiguration. Not to belittle any of your experiences and your unforgettable moments, but take that, the, the, the top of those moments and compare it to the top of this mountain. It's amazing. Dazzling white. Stunning. Something we don't want to forget but there's more to that reason of why we don't want to forget. We don't want to forget because soon after this amazing, dazzling, uh, whiter than bleach moment that we have with our Jesus being transfigured, it's going to be a Jesus that doesn't look so glorious. He's going to go from this mount to another mount, or better yet, we usually call it a hill, Calvary. And on that mountain, he's, he's not going to look glorious. He's not going to look dazzling white. No, he's going to look beaten, bloodied, and bruised. He's going to be on a cross, a, a curse for us. And so when we go from here to this other place, don't forget this moment. Don't forget who Jesus really is as he unveils to Peter, James, and John and us through his word that he really is who he said to be. As we've been piecing together throughout this epiphany season, we've been seeing glimpses of his glory. And today it's full-fledged right there on the mountain for all to see. Well, for all of us to see. See, he didn't want anyone else to know. That's how he ended his lesson. Don't go and tell everyone else who I am just yet. That, that wasn't time. It wasn't ready for, for everybody to know exactly the glory that he had, even though if you were paying attention to him and his ministry, you would piece together who Jesus really is. As we've been going from the river to the mountain here, We've etched together this wonderful picture of our Savior, that Jesus is the God-man, that this Jesus who was born in Bethlehem, uh, the babe of Bethlehem at Christmas, who came into the world as the light of the world is for all the world, we see him now dazzling white. We call this his transfiguration. So today we wear white. We uh, adorn the church in white because of this wonderful change that took place. Transfiguration is the Latin word of the Greek word metamorphosis, which means changed. Jesus changed before them. His appearance changed. 
Really, this was an unveiling to show who he truly was. And who was Jesus? Well, as we've gone along throughout Epiphany, we've learned more and more about him and clarifying just exactly that he truly is the God-man. The Son of God who came into this world for one purpose, to save the world. And that means everything to us. Because God said it was too small a thing during this Epiphany season to save just the Israelites. It was too small a thing to do that. So he sent his son into the world for all the world, for the Gentiles too. So that means you, my friends, my dear fellow brothers and sisters, Jesus came just for you. This God-man who unveils that he truly is the God-man today came for you. What a special moment this is. Special moment that we don't want to forget. And surely something, surely something that Peter, James, and John didn't want to forget either. Remember what Peter said when he was up there? After he sees this dazzling sight, this, this uh, transition of, of Jesus being whiter than even anyone could bleach them. In other translations or other um, gospels, it talks about him being dazzling white or as bright as the sun. Peter didn't know what to say, so he says, it's good for us to be here. And it is good to be in the presence of God. It's wonderful to be in the presence of God. That's, that's why we, we come to church, to, to see a little bit of his glory unveiled through the gospel. That's what we can't wait to see when we get to heaven, to be with Christ, to be with God, and all believers, to be in his presence. It is good to be with the Lord. But if we are actually in the Lord's presence, if the Lord were to come right here before us right now, we would also be like Peter in this understanding that we are terrified. He didn't know what to say. So he said, let's, let's keep this moment. Let's, let's make three tents. One for you, Moses and Elijah. He didn't know what to say because they were terrified. Can you imagine the awesome, dazzling, white, presence of Jesus standing right before you right now. There'll be a part of us that knows as our new man, our new self, that this is good, this is right, we want to be with Jesus. But there'll be that other part of our old sinful nature that says this is Jesus in all his glory right before us, and I am unworthy to stand before him. And so we would be terrified just like Peter, James, and John. We would fall to our knees prostrate ourselves in worship before him and say, we are not worthy to be in your presence. And that's because of our sins. That's because of who we are by nature. Who Jesus was by nature is God. He came into the world as God, never ceased to be God, and always will be God. And so he was perfect in every sense of the word. When you and I came into the world, we inherited our parents' sinfulness. And there was nothing we could do about it. So we have that inherited sin, that, that, that natural sin inside us that plagues us for all our lives. And we can see that at a very young age. One of my favorite illustrations, and, and maybe, maybe one day I'll, I'll be able to uh, do this with my, my, my nephews who are you know, two and younger, put a toy between them, just one toy, two, two little kids in a room, and you see what happens. That's the sinful nature. And it grows from there as we begin to walk and talk and do all these other things, that evil within our heart manifests throughout our, our mouths and our thoughts and our actions. You tell a toddler not to do something. Don't, don't touch the stove. Don't press that button. And they'll give you that look. I'm going to do it. That's our sinful nature. As we grow older, we, we see it come about in several different ways. We see it in our lives today, no matter what age we are. So to be in the presence of an awesome God, 
a, a wonderful God, a dazzling white God who is perfect in every sense of the word, our sinful nature side of us would be like, this is terrifying. But it's because of this wonderful, dazzling, white Jesus and what he was about to do next that makes it so there's another side of us that says it's good for us to be here. And that's why we don't want to forget this moment. We don't want to forget who Jesus, the God-man, is as he goes from here on this journey we call Lent all the way to the cross on Calvary's Hill. He goes from from looking all glorious to not looking glorious, even though he really is full of glory on that cross. He goes from from dazzling white to half-naked, bruised, covered in blood, all for you and me. And it's because he goes here and sacrifices himself, a a one-and-done sacrifice, once for all, that you and I can stand here before the Lord, That, or, or if the Lord were to be before us, and say, it is good to be here. It is because of Jesus who came and suffered and paid for your sins and mine and the whole world. Remember, too small a thing for just Israelites, but the whole world. Because he did that, we look forward to being with our God in heaven. That sinful nature that manifests itself even from a young age in our thoughts and words and actions that grows with us until we're an old age, well, that has been taken care of by Christ. As we talked about throughout this Epiphany season, it's because of who Jesus is. And it's because of who he is that he came to do what he did. Who he is is that perfect recipe of God and man all wrapped up in one to be our Savior. And what he did is take that perfect life that only he could live and go to that cross. And it's because he's man that he could die. And it's because he's God that his death could pay for all people. So don't forget this moment of transfiguration as we move forward into Lent. Don't forget this moment of who Jesus really is as he goes on and people treat him not like the God that he is, but as some mere man, as somebody who made wild and ludicrous claims about who he was, who goes and is crucified on the curse of a tree. Don't forget this moment. And so as we journey from here through Lent to Good Friday, also look ahead to Easter. Also look ahead to what that means for us. That Jesus didn't just die for you and me. No, he rose for us, assuring us of his victory, proclaiming that he truly was who he said he was and did what he said he would do and conquered it. Sin, death, and the devil is only he could do. That's what we want to remember. That's what we want to look forward to. Maybe there's times in your life when you have a memory, an unforgettable moment that will be with you till the end of your days here, this side of heaven. We cherish those moments. We love those moments. We, we, we tell them to our friends and family. That's because they mean a lot to us. But there's one moment that stands out that we want to always remember, no matter what your background is, where you came from, and that is when we first had that light bulb go off, that first epiphany to understand Jesus is my Savior. Let us not forget this moment of the transfiguration or the moment when we fully comprehended this stuff and not not in just a head knowledge way, but in a heart knowledge way. Or we could not just see with eyes, but see through eyes of faith 
through the lens of faith that Jesus is my Savior, that Jesus is my God, that this Jesus who's on this glorious mountain has to go to another. But he does that for me. And he does that for you. So what I'm trying to say as I land this plane is don't forget this moment. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God which transcends all understanding may it guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue with a confession of faith. We use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Maybe seated as we continue with the prayer of the church. For the prayer this morning, we have a special intercession. Uh, Judy Berenson's mother was called home to heaven, uh, and the funeral will be later uh, this following week. And we wanted to keep Judy and her family in our prayers as they, uh, on the one hand, will miss their mother, uh, but on the other hand, are happy she's with the Lord, where it is good to be with the Lord. We pray. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all your mercies, especially for the gift of your Son, through whom you have revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. Strengthen and defend your church, that by your word and sacraments, faith may grow and love toward all may increase. Keep our children in the grace of their baptism. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Let your blessing rest on planting and harvest, commerce and industry, medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel, all who care for those who work, whose work is difficult or dangerous. Be with all who devote themselves to the Covered all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you, who now rest from their labors, especially as we consider Judy's mother. We pray that you would be with the family. Help them to know that because of what Jesus has done for them, that there is an eternity of life everlasting with him in heaven. So we pray that you would console those who are mourning or living with any sadness. Bring us at last to the joys of heaven. 
Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus who died and rose again. We continue with the offering. We ask that you also use this opportunity to fill out the connection cards located in your worship folder. You can do so with a paper copy or digitally with the QR code. Uh, if you've done this before, we thank you. We ask that you do it again. If this is your first time, uh, we ask that you, you take that leap and do it because we just love to know who worships with us. And if there's any way we can minister to you or pray for you, you can write a prayer on the back of that card as well. And we'll, we'll look at it throughout the week and, and say prayers for you as well. Thank you. We continue with our next hymn on page 14.
Please stand as we close with prayer. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, when we next gather for worship, it will be Ash Wednesday, the first day of Lent. On that day, we will begin our solemn journey to the Savior's cross, while the joy of faith remains undiminished throughout the year, our rejoicing during Lent is muted and quiet. For centuries, therefore, Christian churches have omitted their most jubilant songs during this season, including the word Alleluia, which means praise the Lord. Now, for a time, we say farewell to Alleluia. We do this to prepare ourselves for the quieter days of Lent. The Alleluias will return on Easter dawn as we gather to shout our praise to the risen Lord. You may be seated. Good morning once again. 
Glad to have you with us in worship. Again, a special welcome to our guests. We hope that you can join us again. Um, we have a number of things going on this week at Good Shepherd, especially at our Cedar Rapids campus. One of the main things is that, uh, as we just sang about, uh, Lent is coming. So we have our midweek services. If you turn to page 19 in your worship folder there, you can see all of the different things that we have going on. Wednesday, February 14th, we have our first service, Ash Wednesday. If you are planning to attend that evening service or really any of the Wednesday evening services, please sign up uh, so that we can make sure that we have enough food for our Lenten meals beforehand. The sign up is downstairs around the offices. There's like a, a, a easel there with some different sheets there and the different meals that are coming as well. So you can sign up and let us know about that. Some other things that are a little bit new that are happening is that on Friday, we're going to be starting our first gathering for our Lutheran Libations League. What is our Lutheran Libations League, you ask? Well, this is an opportunity for adults in their 20s, 30s, and up to enjoy some beverages together. Uh, there's two rules, though. You can't bring any kids. This is a kid-free zone. This is for adults. And then second, you have to invite somebody to come. So if you have a friend who you're looking to bring to church and you're like, oh, bringing to church is kind of a big ask. Well, maybe if you ask them out for a drink, it's a little bit easier. And then we can start building a relationship that way. So that's the thought behind this whole thing. That'll be at the new Big Grove here in Cedar Rapids starting at 730 on Friday. Um, if you are planning to attend, we asked if you could text or email Laura King so that we can get a count and maybe uh, just give them a heads up that we're having this many people come. Uh, we talked a little bit about Lenten meals coming up. There's also Little Lamb's Play Group. We did this last month. This is like a, a mommy and me kind of program. We're doing it again. Registration is open for February 17th. That'll be this Saturday. The play group goes from like 10 to 11 and follows with a snack after. It's a $5 fee per family. And so uh, just to cover snacks and things like that, just a, a great way to come. If you don't have kids, that's, that's fine. You, I mean, uh, but you could tell people about this wonderful event. This is kind of like a soft step in the bigger picture of early childhood ministry. Other than that, I'll let you read the rest of the announcements for yourself. Um, the last one that I want to make is that we're starting a new Bible study. We finished the one about the comprehensive congregational planning, which was more of or less a Bible study, just a study. Uh, now we're going to be getting into the minor prophets. So if you want to stick around for some fellowship downstairs and then starting on the minor prophets, we'll look at uh, an overview of the prophets and then also the first three chapters of Hosea. Now I'm done, I promise. Uh, God bless your week.